I'd like to welcome to stage uh, Michael Stolls from Gameloft, who's going to be talking to us about how to keep up with mobile gaming trends. Okay, I guess I'll get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my talk today is going to be about from, uh, from data to development. So this is how we at Gameloft Toronto uh, research our data, analyze our data, and, um, and then turn that into kind of our, our development process early on through the conception phase. So um, before diving into it, uh, I'll introduce a bit of myself. So I am the studio manager at Gameloft Toronto. Um, Gameloft Toronto has been uh, uh, open since, uh, it's about 11 years now. So we have uh, about 120, 130 uh, employees at Gameloft Toronto. We've made numerous different mobile games. Uh, we've worked with numerous different IPs like Uno and uh, Mattel with Uno and Friends. We've worked with Lego and, uh, and our, one of our longest running games is Disney Magic Kingdoms, which uh, is about six years live right now. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, I've been in the video game industry myself for about 15 years, uh, starting pre-smartphones and pre-iPhones and Androids, everything like that. I started on old Nokia's. Um, the indestructible ones, the old Mo Motorola Razors, um, and uh, so with early J2ME and Brew games. Um, the majority of my experience is with mobile, mobile games, mobile platforms. I've spent uh, 11 years at Gameloft Toronto. Previously, I was at Gameloft Montreal, so I have quite a bit of uh, mobile experience. And I do come from a technical background, so I... Uh, Started as a programmer, moved into a lead programmer role, technical director, and then now uh, recently as a studio manager at Gameloft Toronto. So that's a bit about me. And then I think uh, the question we always ask, this is where we're at right now, especially at uh, Gameloft Toronto, is we're, we're trying to start a project. What do we start? We, uh, you know, there's lots of different ideas. There's a big market. What do we want to start with? So we start with a bit of data analysis. So we have different sources of data. Gameloft has a uh, consumer marketing intelligence team. This team is great for providing surveys, different market feedback, what type of genres are working, what type of genres aren't working. Um, they can provide uh, a lot of different information for us to roll with. We have third-party market research companies. So one I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, these are companies that we can partner with that allow us to run surveys at a larger scale, bigger scope of, uh, of information from people. And, um, and again, allow us to kind of narrow down what the market is showing and what, uh, what um, area we want to go into with our future games. And then finally, some uh, uh, other third parties like Sensor Tower and Game Refinery. These are all tools that we use to collect data on uh, store information, revenue, installs, what's happening, what genre is good, what genre is bad. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we take a lot of these different data sources and we try to combine them and uh, and uh, figure out how we're going to, what we're going to build next. So to start, um, one of the third party companies that we did partner with, Ledger, uh, they did a survey across Can uh, Canadians um, to start talking about Canadian gaming habits over the past couple of years with the pandemic. But why is Canada important um, for us? So Canada can be used to identify, at least in our, our, our mindset, uh, bigger trends in bigger markets. So um, we can, we can kind of correlate uh, Canadian habits with uh, United States um, and users in the United States, so which is a much bigger market um, to us. We often soft launch our games in Canada for this reason. This allows us to, uh, well, first technically make sure that the game works well on a smaller scope before going worldwide, but also to allow us to rebalance and uh, make sure that it's going to be a good positive experience for the, uh, for the end user. The video game industry, I think it was mentioned earlier, the video game industry in Canada, in Toronto specifically, continues to grow. Um, in my 15 years, I've seen it go just crazy in Toronto, and we now have a lot of different new studios, indie studios, competitors, um, which would have been great 15 years ago when I was fresh out of school looking for a job, but, uh, but no, it's always awesome to see. So I think we're seeing a lot of good, positive growth in the industry. And then finally, I think as a Canadian myself, as a Canadian studio, um, it's, just, it's important for us to look at Canadians and look at how we can actually bring some entertainment some joy to, uh, to Canadian users and Canadian gamers. So, um, so a little bit of habits uh, that we saw with the, the first survey. So this survey was taken at the end of 2021. Um, what we saw a bit from the pandemic is that we did see a bit of a bump in terms of uh, users who started playing games and continue playing them. Uh, they started during the pandemic. So this is about a 16% bump in, uh, in users, which is great. Um, we're sitting around 
uh, at least on the survey, about 46% of Canadians continue to play games at, at some form of, or another, you know, some type of platform, mobile, console, or, uh, or PC. So this is great. We have um, quite a lot of Canadian users and quite a, lot of, uh, a range of uh, people we can hit there with the market. Uh, some of the platforms used by games, uh, Canadian gamers. So we have at the top there mobile. So one of the more uh, commonly used and probably one of the more preferred used. So this uh, continues to again validate our, our efforts and our, um, our kind of agenda to, to continue to focus on the mobile uh, platform. Um, despite it becoming more and more bloated of, uh, of a market, we still see an opportunity for, for growth in, uh, in mobile games and we still feel like it's an area that we can continue as a company, as a studio to grow into. But we also see a whole other range of, of platforms there that we are um, needing to focus on. So I think this validates Game Loft's uh, strategy to expand, go more cross-platform, um, figure out how we can uh, reach other users on PC, console, uh, as well as mobile. So um, some of the spending habits of Canadians. So um, free-to-play model is still, I think, one of the more commonly used and uh, commonly pre like top preferred of Canadian users. So um, this, again, it, it's something that we do with our mobile games. We do have a, a, what we hope is a well-balanced and a positive experience for our users to be able to come in and enjoy the game and, uh, and purchase where they see fit. Uh, game subscription. So this is not something that we're actively looking at in Gameloft Toronto, but it is something that we feel could correlate to uh, features in game like uh, season pass, battle pass, um, something where a user will spend to uh, acquire a certain amount of content or experience for an, a, a certain amount of time. So, and then finally, subscription for a service. So this would be your Apple Arcade or your uh, Xbox Game, uh, game Pass, um, where we're actively looking and trying to partner with, uh, with some of those um, first parties to uh, see and establish how we can uh, build those platforms, again, bring another source of games to, to users so that they can experience and enjoy on uh, all different levels. So, um, another source of data we use, Sensor Tower, I mentioned. So this can be used for, for different store information. Um, some of this uh, data here is for revenue from the end of 2021. Um, RPG, continuing to be the lead, uh, lead genre for 2021, followed by strategy and puzzle. We have strategy that grew by 2 billion year over year. Um, RPG and bu uh, puzzle seeing a 1.1 and 1.2 uh, billion dollar increase um, in revenue. And then we see action with a 58% growth, uh, which is quite a large number and quite a large growth. And I think this is um, thanks to, uh, to one strong performer on the market that came out in 2021. So that was more of an open world adventure game that was grouped into the action phase. So that's uh, uh, a bit on the revenue, but what, um, at least what Sensor Tower is showing is that in the start of 2022, all top five genres have posted a decline in revenue, so this could either be a, a rebalancing of some of the, the, um, the boosts we saw during the pandemic. This could be inflation, market adjustments, um, anything like that. So uh, something that we keep an eye on. As well, we keep an eye on installs. So I think installs is one of the things we always try to focus on at Game Off Toronto. We want to make sure we reach as many users as we can. Hyper-casual, we continue to see the rise of hyper-casual games in terms of installs. I think this makes sense in terms of people getting a good boost, good kick of, uh, of enter entertainment, and then moving on to, to uh, something else. Um, all other genres uh, saw a small decline in 2021. Again, I don't think anything too concerning that would make us uh, panic and run, but um, something that we do continue to, to follow. And, um, and then finally on hyper casual, so this is not something that we're doing actively at Game Loft Toronto, but it is a, a source of insp inspiration for us. So we, um, we w look more at casual and mid core games at Game Loft Toronto, but we could also look at what works with hyper casual in, a, in terms of a game mechanic, a feature, um, and then expand on that, give it more depth, give it more uh, content and more of a, a casual or mid core experience. So that's, um, even though we don't focus on hyper-casual, we still want to make sure we're looking at, uh, at, at that data. And then finally, after going through all the um, different data points, we ask additional questions to our teams. We ask, is this genre right for us? Um, does it fit into our studio uh, you know, specialties? Is this a studio want? Is this something that our team really feels like they should do? Because I think that's still very important. 
is there room in the market to grow? Just because the uh, RPG genre is on the rise, are we actually able to, to uh, inject ourselves and inject a new project into that um, genre? How will we do that? Would it be a strong IP that contributes to that success? Um, we did that. Uh, we've worked previously with different IPs, so Disney obviously for Disney Magic Kingdom is a great um, IP to help attract users into, uh, into our game. And then finally, what is the anticipated cost to acquire new users? So uh, I think this is all big questions we ask at the start to make sure that we're kind of heading down a path uh, that we feel will, will provide a good, good successful project at the end. So what do we do with all this data? This is where we get into our early conception phase of, uh, at Gameloft Toronto. So this is where we get into what we call the lab. So the lab has, it starts with an idea phase. So in the idea phase, we have a small core team, and uh, this core team are kind of the gatekeepers, the, uh, the, the ones that really decide which ideas will move on and, and which ideas will kind of get put back on the back burner. So, but we do encourage all our team members to submit ideas. We want all total studio uh, involvement at this point. Concepts that are submitted are submitted uh, with required specific details. So we want to make sure that it's a full, complete product being uh, submitted, thought out, well, um, well, uh, well packaged together. So this includes unique selling points, market comparisons, and then different uh, monetization and retention strategies. So we really want to look at the game as not just a feature or a gameplay, but more about the whole package. How will we sell this to the user? We have no attachments. So at this phase, it's very important that uh, Concepts are submitted, but um, people have to know that you know, some will be put on the back burner, some will not be a right fit for our studio, the IP might be too difficult to work with. Um, so we don't try not to have uh, attachments, but we do try to clo uh, close down or, or shelve projects with proper justification. I think it's important to our teams that we go through the proper uh, evaluation so that we don't discourage them of just kind of dismissing their ideas without any uh, proper justification. And then finally, this is an ongoing process. So we like to keep our think tank working. Um, even if we've gone through this process and we've moved a project into a full production, there's many game loss studios worldwide that are looking or maybe looking to start a new project and then we can take an idea and they might be able to, uh, to jump on that one and, and roll with it. So after we do have a project that moves from the conception phase uh, or the idea phase, we push it into the appeals phase. So this is where we start getting a bit more creative. We create different ads that we're going to test. Um, then these ads will visually represent what our intended gameplay will be. Um, and I, I, like I said, this is intended gameplay. We don't want anything clickbaity. We don't want anything like we see in, in many different UA uh, or marketing campaigns where you're, you're excited about a game and then you go in and it's completely different and, and not what you were expecting at all. So we look for a truly accurate representation of what our gameplay is to be. That, that will ensure that um, the results we're getting back from those tests are accurate and we can proceed forward. Um, we can also test similar ideas but with different contexts. So we might take a tycoon game, put it in space, or put it in the medieval times, or throw dinosaurs in there, and we can pit those ideas all together and kind of uh, and see which one um, comes out on top or which idea turned out better. So, um, and, then finally, uh, and then we evaluate all that based on, on specific KPIs. So we look at clicks, we look at click-through rates, uh, we look at ad spends, and these are all areas that we were able to evaluate, okay, which idea worked, which idea didn't, did all the ideas not hit the mark and we should go back to another, uh, back to our idea phase and scrap this one. Um, but then finally, what we also can do with the results is we can break it down into criteria. So we can start looking at, did it hit the target, target audience that we, um, we expected it to? Do we want to hit a certain age range, and, and, but we hit you know, a, a different one, and, and that might be a red flag for us, and maybe we have to go back to the drawing board and really think uh, about what we're doing. But if we do have an appeals test that we're quite happy with, and we have an idea that's gone through this phase, we now move into the prototyping phase. So this is where we get more technical. We stu still do continue with a small team. We have a, a team of under 10, um, maybe around five if we're, if we're really trying to, trying to push a, a small team mentality. We continue with a small timeline, so we're looking to make these prototypes with four to six weeks um, uh, active development. We want a prototype that can give us two to three days of, uh, of player experience so that we can properly evaluate um, installs, we can properly evaluate how many people are playing, coming back to the game, um, early day retention, 
Um, and then we release this to a small limited audience so that uh, we, we won't uh, worry about localization to try to hit a mass market globally. We will focus on smaller countries just to, to get enough players to start seeing how that early day retention really is and, um, and is this a project that we want to continue with. Um, and like I said, uh, we, the, at this stage, the success is evaluated by our installs, by our early day retention. We want to see uh, who's playing our game, how did it hit, do they come back for day one, day two, day three. Um, and then at that point, we'll, uh, we'll determine you know, what, uh, if this is a success or not. At, and then the final point, this is still uh, a no attachment process of the project. So we have games that will get all the way to the prototyping phase. We've done what we can in four to six uh, weeks. We release it, may fall flat completely. No one likes it, no one comes back day one, uh, day two. And, um, and we will, uh, we will, at that point, we will shelve, shelve the idea. We may decide to shelve the idea just because it's, uh, it's not something that we feel we can make a successful product out of, not worth our investment any further. So we shelve that. But if we do find an, uh, a project that gets through this phase, gets through the prototyping phase, we shift now to production. So this, uh, to me, is, is the final successful moment of the lab's job. Their job is complete. Um, they've found us a concept and something that we're excited and feel we can have a, a positive experience with, so we will now shift this into a full production, put a proper team on it, build a proper milestone uh, uh, release schedule, live ops, everything like that, um, but we still aim to be very quick to the market, so we want to not take three years to do these projects because as we've seen, the market changes so quickly. If you take three years, everything will... Uh, will um, will be different by the time you release. So, and that's it. That's a bit of our, uh, our process going through uh, conception. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for any questions. We've got one question, anyone from the audience? Oh, yeah, running over. Oh, hello. Oh, how are you? Go for it. What's your name? Miriam. I'm Miriam. Hey, uh, nice to see you again. Yeah. yeah. So two very short questions. Yes. And you might have mentioned it and I didn't hear it. In the first phase when you're just posting the ads, mm -hmm. where do the clicks drive to? The, uh, so we're using different, like, we, I think we'll use Facebook at that point to kind okay. of, uh, to, as our main source of, of presenting the ads and then uh, determining the So when they the click results. on them, they just go to a landing page? or they'll la Oh, they'll land at a, um, it may be a survey page, it may be a page that tells the user, like, this is a game that's in development. Okay. Um, we might ask a few questions about why it attracted them to them. Okay. But we try to be as upfront to not discourage the user that, like, hey, you just clicked on an ad for, for no reason, but we do want to try to involve them early on the process, so. Okay, yeah. great. And then in terms of the release to the small audience, is that mm -hmm. a predefined small audience, or are you doing a public beta but limiting it to Canada? I think we'll try to limit to a, like a region, like a country. So okay. we, um, we might, Canada might even be too big of a, a market at, at some point. I can't remember what we did on our last one, but it was definitely, we only wanted a few thousand users at this point. We didn't right. want to okay. hit any of our big And markets. you're still running an ad campaign to get the people in the door for that small campaign? We'll... Um, Sorry, it's not that I'm going to totally copy your strategy. No, no. I just want some more details. No, that's uh, we'll, usually when we've moved a game into the prototyping phase, we may throw some ad, ad spend towards it when we've released the prototype. But at that point, we keep this as a constant cycle. So we'll, keep, we'll have more and more games in the ad phase or the appeal phases at that point. So we try to keep it as a, a constant cycle. Um, but yeah, we will try to put more uh, put ad spend towards our prototypes to see if we can get people in there. So. Great, thank you so much. Another round of applause, please. Right. Michael. Thank you.